welcome to The Hop. This is David Charles Allen, Realtor at Village Properties in Santa Barbara with my good friend and co-host, Patty Teal. How are you doing today, Patty? I'm great, David. The weather here is kind of nippy, but it's really nice, and I'm excited for Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's exciting to have, uh, I mean, a snow Thanksgiving would be cool, or a snow Christmas as well. I don't think I've experienced one of those yet, so that could be interesting to have one of those. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's not happening in Santa Barbara, that's for sure. So this week's weather, we're looking ahead to, again, mostly sunny days in the mid to high 60s. Uh, the swells have been coming in more consistently. So we've had some kind of, some fun little medium-sized swell days. Um, there looks to be more potential bigger swell on the horizon. So just continue to keep an eye out on the buoys and what's coming in and have a great time out there. Yeah, every surfer be careful, but have fun have fun that's for sure so we'll continue with mortgage rates they haven't changed since the last time we we're on they're 2.75 for conforming 30-year fixed and 2.875 for non-conforming jumbo so what's interesting is i've actually have a friend of mine who got a refinance rate at 2.6 percent so that's interesting because typically refinance rates are higher than your uh, purchase rate. Um, but in this case, it's actually lower than a purchase rate. So um, you can find those cheaper rates from the usually the, the online loan people like Loan Depot or Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage. Now, those companies work great for getting a refinance. Um, they're a little more difficult in terms of using them in your original purchase. Um, because when you're originally purchasing the home, everything's on a time limit. And when you're and if you're competing against multiple offers, agents are going to look at your mortgage coming from one of these guys, and they're not going to know if they're going to be able to perform in the amount of time that's needed to close escrow. So while it's not the best to potentially use these people on your purchase contract, it does seem like you can get a really good refinance rate with them. And then when you're refinancing, the time doesn't matter, essentially. You're not on a strict limit and you're not competing against other people. So it can work great for people looking for a refinance. I would talk to a specialist or a realtor you know about using it on a purchase contract. Good, that's good advice, David. A lot of people have refinanced and they've cut their expenses down quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, if you're refinancing from... Three and a half percent down to two and a half percent, you're saving a couple hundred dollars at least every month, thousand dollars a year. And then you're looking over 30 years of your mortgage, depending how long it is, you're saving tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. um, over the period of your mortgage. So if you can lock it into a low rate, it's definitely worth it. And a lot of these online companies are also doing it so you just have to pay for the appraisal usually refinances can cost anywhere from five to ten thousand and there's a lot of deals going on right now where you just pay for a 500 hundred dollar appraisal and you can get the refinance and i mean it's a great opportunity for some people boy it sounds like it yeah so let's move into the statistics of what's going on in the real estate market this last week so we have four coming soon listings so that's a huge drop in comparison to 15. We have 36 new listings, another potentially big drop from 51 the week previous, 12 price changes, um, 50 pendings and 50 closings. So pendings and closing are staying consistent. We've only down six pendings as comparison to last week time we're on. But as you can see, we're dropping new listings because this is the slow time of year where a lot of homes aren't coming on the market. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see if the demand stays consistent even during this holiday period and supply could potentially contract even more because less people want to list their homes now. Um, uh -huh. So we'll just kind of see how where it takes us. Yeah, I know you'll keep us updated and posted every week and we appreciate that. Yep, we'll keep you updated right here. Today, we have a great guest and one I'm very excited about, veterinarian, Dr. Kirsten Jorgensen. How are you doing, Kirsten? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. So growing up in Healdsburg with a bunch of animals on the farm, how early did you know when you wanted to become a vet? Honestly, as soon as I knew I needed a job, 
you know, when you grew up, <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. So it was a, it was a pretty, I've been extremely lucky that it actually worked out to get into vet school and that I loved it and still love it, you know, now that I'm on the other side. So I, I feel very, very lucky that that all worked as well as it did. That's great. Well, tell us a little bit more about growing up on a farm. How was that experience like? Yeah. So, you know, it was, it's kind of always been funny to compare with friends that lived in town. Things like I, I don't even think to order takeout and have it delivered because for the longest time, no one would ever come to our place. Not that <laughs> we're that far out, but we're, we're far enough out that, you know, they, used, they wouldn't deliver pizza or something like that. Um, you know, and then a different, just a whole different mindset of like each morning and each night, you have to think about who's home and going to feed everybody and, you know, make sure everything's okay, you know, twice a day versus just kind of getting to wander off. And so I think there is a, it's an interesting thing to grow up with that kind of sense of responsibility for something else that's not, you know, just another person or, or something like that and that connection to it. And then just instilled in me like a huge love of our landscape here in Sonoma County and feel so blessed to get to live here and be from this area like this and enjoy it every day. Was it a farm with crops, Kristen, or was it more like a horse ranch? It's more of a horse ranch. My mom used to be a trainer and a horse breeder. She's pretty much retired now and we just have more for personal use and fun. Uh, horses a lot less at one point there were about 35 to 40 horses on the property and now we're down to like eight which is an all-time low and intermittently we'll have sheep as well but no no like plant crops my dad had worked on a hay farm but that was up in Modoc County so not here in Healdsburg oh nice so being a native of Healdsburg I'm a native of Santa Barbara and I haven't left yet have you ever thought about living someplace else or has that ever crossed your mind? It it definitely did. And I I we as veterinarians, we it's a voluntary thing to take an internship and I really loved that opportunity and ended up living in Connecticut, which I thought was great opportunity to actually see like the other side of the country and I got to experience four seasons and snow and things like that. And so um I I loved that opportunity. Like I'm, I'm very rooted here, but I did want to know what is it like elsewhere, you know, and, and gain a little deeper appreciation for the place that I live. Cause kind of like Santa Barbara, that's a great place. You don't, you don't want to leave once you're, you're there. It's hard to get back in. Exactly. So speaking with you before the show, you let me know you have a passion for helping older dogs and that's kind of brought in your approach to studying new techniques how has that worked for you? It's It's been great. You know, I, I love being able to offer so many modalities to just make their lives better, longer, and more comfortable. You know, it used to just be you added arthritis medications and you know, it was just kind of came to a point where, you know, the medications maybe weren't enough. And so to be able to do something like acupuncture that I studied in after school, you know, where there's no side effects to that, that it only adds to their lives. It won't ever have any downsides to that or side effects that would make their lives worse. That was a huge thing. And then the owner of the clinic where I worked, Dr. Marty Schaefer, invested in a therapeutic laser as well. And so the two of those work really well together to help ease, you know, kind of the normal aches and pains that you can see, especially in, and cats hide it as well, their arthritis, and then, you know, other speed healing from other injuries as well. And so it's been great to be able to add that without worrying, like I said, about side effects from medications as well. Yeah, oh, that's great. I think I mentioned as we were chatting before the show that my dog Otis died a couple of years ago and he was almost, well, he was getting up there 23, 24 years old. I almost lost track there at the end, but his last couple of years, he was paralyzed. They tried to put him on steroids and things and it made him not feel so good. So I took him to, I'm not sure if I'll get the term right, but it was elect 
electrical acupuncture yeah. that they yeah, did on him. Acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, electrical acupuncture. Yeah. And so within acupuncture, there's the dry needles, like we all think of, you know, where you see kind of looks like a pin cushion, all the needles and the different acupuncture points. Then there's electro acupuncture where you can actually use a gentle current through those needles across different points to help stimulate them and, and speed healing or comfort with that. Or like in the cases of paralysis, try to reform kind of those connections in the body. There's also aqua acupuncture, which is usually the injection of like vitamin B or a supplement like that at specific acupuncture points so that they're triggered longer past their treatment session. There's also like moxibustion, which is using kind of burning herbs to help warm and stimulate those spots as well. So, you know, we think of the classic acupuncture with the needles, but there's a lot, a big, a uh, lot of different ways to use that, I guess you could say. Yeah, and Otis wow. would get so relaxed when he went in there. I mean, it's true, I do live in Sedona, and so you might think it's kind of new agey, but in, they had the room all set up, and they had the soft music playing, and he just would be very at ease. It wasn't like going in and getting on an exam table, so it was really kind yeah. of a cool experience for him. That's the nice thing, is we have some patients that come regularly, the older patients, and they... Like one of them, she like runs in and lays down on her mat and is Aww. just ready to go for her treatments. And so oh my it, gosh. it's just, it's so it warms your heart to see it that because you know, they just give to us so much all so the time. Much. So mm -hmm. to be able to give back and keep them comfortable and we all want our companions with us as long as possible. So. Yeah. Until you, until they're miserable. You know, yeah. I, I knew when it was time for him to go and I probably kept him around longer than most people would, but I could tell he still ate his food. He still barked when he wanted something, but at one point when he stopped eating and he was in really severe pain, it was like, I can't let him yeah. suffer anymore because he was going to go imminently in the next few days. And I just didn't want it to be miserable. So, yeah. yeah, but you mentioned also a therapeutic laser. So I wondered what kind of laser you use on. Yeah. Animals. So it's not, I think their lasers come in classes in class one is like your laser pointer kind of thing where it's like, yes, don't point it in your eyes. It, it is powerful, but the Therapeutic laser is a class four and it's, it warms the tissue and actually helps activate a lot of the cellular processes within the body to help that eight, the help uh, healing, pain control, control swelling, those sorts of things. And again, without often the side effects of like steroids, like you said, or some of those other medications. And so that can be done periodically to help with pain or wounds, you know, lots of different treatments. Oh, nice. So I was going to ask you about how the results you've seen, but you kind of mentioned the dog was so excited to come back and lay down and have it have at it again. Has that been pretty consistent where people keep coming back to these kind of things? It has, you know, unfortunately, it's, in a sense, it's kind of like a medication that way in that, you know, I can't just do treatments once or twice and then they're cured forever. Exactly. A lot of times these chronic issues like this, they need to come back and visit, but we often do kind of like a loading dose in a sense where I'll see them once a week for three to five weeks. And then, then we kind of wait and I, I like owners to let me know. And most of them come back and say, you know, we, we went two weeks and then, then I noticed they weren't jumping up like they had been, or then I noticed, you know, they, they didn't come and greet me at the door quite the same way or something like mm -hmm. that. And then we can start to tailor for that patient, how often they would need treatments to help keep them that comfortable. That's really beautiful. I love Fascinating. that. Fascinating. And can you use that same kind of treatment, both uh, the laser and the acupuncture on horses as well? Yeah. Yeah. And it, the horses are kind of even like some of the dogs and cats that I've treated. It's very funny. I have some of my horses love acupuncture. And so I, I'll needle them and I'll go and I'll do something else. And they just take a nap and they're happy as a clam. And one of my horses, she absolutely hates it. She's very sensitive. And so mm -hmm. we just don't do it. And I can do acupressure, which is using just fingertips to use, create pressure at the sites of the acupuncture points. And that's less stimulating than the needles. 
and they also quite enjoy the laser as well, just for, again, that kind of warming, soothing sensation that it has. Wow. So how many pressure points are in a dog, so to say? Is everyone different or does every dog have the same amount of pressure points? So they do have the same amount of acupuncture points throughout their body. And, you know, I probably am supposed to remember how many there are. And it's <laughs> Say a number. We won't know the difference. So, yeah, <laughs> probably kind of close to bones. I want to say two or 300 points. Wow. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> and the interesting thing in studying this is that there are kind of, there are points that they've found on these specific species, like in the history of acupuncture, horses were very important, you know, for your mobility and, and working on the farm and things like that. And so they have some points specific to them. And then there are points that are actually the points on people that they found by treating people and they transpose them to dogs and cats and horses and rabbits and, you know, whatever you want to treat. And so there's this kind of interesting meld of all these points where, you know, some I can find on me and then I can find on the dog and they're the same point and they have the same action. And then there's some others that are very specific to that species from their research. You know, the average veterinarian uh, or the typical, I should say, don't know if there's an average, but uh, (laughs) probably doesn't know the methodology and hasn't had the training that you've had. Have you had to take separate courses or study on your own to learn about all these specialties? Yeah, so they, in veterinary school, they did give kind of a brief little like, hey, this is out there, you know, and that kind of is what sparked my interest is like a neurologist who had done a lot of research and was not your like typical holistic medicine kind of person was like, Mm -hmm. I think there's something to acupuncture. I've done a little research, you know, I can block its effects with medications that I have and I know what they do, you know, and so it's starting to be discussed. They don't have the time, unfortunately, to like teach it to us. And so Mm -hmm. Typically, when you have a veterinarian that does acupuncture is that we've taken a course and there are a couple of schools in this country out after vet school or during vet school to get certification afterwards from these different institutes that teach uh, acupuncture. So that's at this point kind of how that comes around. And so besides my whole DVM, I have also what's called a CVA or I'm certified in veterinary acupuncture. And those are a couple extra letters that I can put on the end of all the other letters to <laughs> show that I do that too, <laughs> if I need to. But yeah. I, I have a feeling it will become more and more popular yeah. in the years to come as more and more people explore alternative ways to provide healing. It's yeah. been exciting, like even within pet insurance, like one of my clients has got coverage for her acupuncture treatments with that. So it is, it is becoming more, not necess- maybe mainstream, but very accepted, which is great. Wow. Is there any other kind of alternative medicine you have your eye on looking ahead to study? Potentially, I may look, they have through the institute I studied with, they call it Tui Na, but it's essentially Chinese uh, chiropractic work or body work. Um, And so that might be an interesting route to go. Again, just kind of that physical rehabilitation sort of aspect, especially for horses, since competitive horses, their fitness, their soundness is so important. That's a place that can help a lot of people you know, just kind of achieve their goals and their dreams that way by keeping everybody happy and comfy. Yeah, that's amazing. So do you guys get specialized when you go to vet school in diet? Is is that an extra specialty you have to go out and cure? Or is that something that's trained? Because I know everyone you go to ever always recommends something different. Yeah. And that's a tricky thing. Like we study nutrition in school just as you have to have it. And then I think some of those specific recommendations come a little bit from your personal experience after school and a bit during school. I went to UC Davis and they were very good about the the nutrition center had pretty much all of the 
well-researched foods available to us to use and would even consult to create home-cooked diets for owners. So that kind of let us play with all these different brands and these different types and see them in action. But I think you do get a little bit, I mean, as we all do in, in everything in life, you get changed a little bit by your personal experiences and what works well for you. And so you know, while one vet looks and leans heavily on one brand and another on a you know, different one, that comes up, I think, quite a lot more so after after school than, than during school. That makes sense. Do you see a lot more people shifting to uh, homemade diets for their animals? They're definitely trying to. It, it's a scary situation because there is no way to just cook all the ingredients that you need to balance a diet for your pet at home. They're, they almost always have to be supplemented with their vitamins and minerals. And I think people tend to forget that. We also tend to think about our dogs as carnivores and they're not strict carnivores. It's cats are more so. Dogs are actually a bit of an omnivore and they need a bit of greens in there and maybe a bit of carbs and those sorts of things. And so it can be, I guess, too, this is a personal thing in that for me, it's hard enough to cook for myself. So I don't want to try and cook for my pets as well <laughs> and worry about their nutrition. So, you know, I like the commercial diets that I'm familiar with and comfortable with because I know that there is a veterinary nutritionist, somebody who did specialize in that. They balanced out that diet. They even fed it to dogs or cats before it hit the market. And I know it keeps pets healthy. And so that simplifies a few things in my life for me, which is nice. Yeah, this is self-serving because I told you one of my dogs is already 20 years old and slowing down. But, um, you know, you hear about glucosamine or Mm -hmm. this or that. Are there any supplements that you think are really important for aging dogs? I My preference is for fish oil or the omega-3 type supplements. Okay. You can even honestly just use human fish oils, trying to get, again, that omega-3 aspect of it. Mm -hmm. There's some research about that being highly anti-inflammatory. And so that you can do, and it's usually higher doses than, say, the normal pet supplements might want to tell Mm -hmm. you to give, where you're, you know, close to, depending on the size, but somewhere around 500 or even higher milligrams of just the omega-3, which is a component of the fish oil. Um, so and open think, up a person's capsule and just put it right in your dog's yeah, food. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, quite a bit of that. And I think the capsules that tell you the breakdown of omega-3 versus omega-6 in their fish oil, those are the higher quality ones. And the higher that omega-3 is, the better. And that's one that I think, for me, having read and followed some of the research, the glucosamine and chondroitin, you know, there's some thought, oh, maybe it gets too digested when they eat that to really impact the cartilage as much, but it, it can help. And now there's just a slew of other things looked at like turmeric and green lip mussels and, and things like that, where I haven't been able to keep up with that almost really, that can help quite a bit. And so some of the, some brands will kind of combine all that, or a lot of them will now to really help to where like glucosamine and chondroitin have come kind of like the old, old guard, like, Mm -hmm. and have been passed by, by some of our research in that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So do you have any recommendations to make your companion's life better? I think, well, one, you got to love your companion and, and respect what they want, you know, keeping their lives happy. I think preventative care is usually your best option. So following you're depending on where you're at, because it probably not so much in Arizona, I don't know, but heartworm is an issue here in Sonoma County, which is carried by mosquitoes. So people try to say, well, my dog doesn't go outside or it's not around other dogs, but this is a very potentially deadly parasite carried by these mosquitoes when they bite dogs and either feed off other dogs that are infected or the coyotes or things in our area. And that has the opportunity if they get infected to severely limit their lifespan versus just an easy preventative of either a chewable once a month or now there's a year round injection that prevents it. So following things like that and monitoring dental health and weight 
I think especially their weight and keeping them in a healthy weight range. Those are the kinds of things that really just help your pet live as long and happy a life as possible. Then good fortune. You know, the, Aww, yeah, a little, little luck involved there. Yeah. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry we're going on and on, but we That's just okay. have so many questions. And then we haven't even gotten to the horses yet. But um, so, someone told me that some of the immunizations dogs are getting over immunized, perhaps just like kids, and that there's a way to test so that they're not getting too much in their system. Is that something that you look into? So at our practice, we ask every time, you know, with each annual exam, what is your pet doing, your dog or your cat, to help tailor which vaccines they need for their mm-hmm. lives in what they're doing? because sometimes one dog's at risk of things that other dogs aren't. Um, and that helps tailor that a lot. The, I think you're talking about titers where they check immune function. And unfortunately, our research doesn't always line up that those measurements equal the best immune response. And so we have a hard time just reading those and being like, oh, well, they don't need to be vaccinated again because it's, it's still not quite clear. Right. how that works. And I think, you know, I think that's a difficult one because your average veterinarian to kind of go back to that. Yeah, they are definitely looking to just do the vaccines your pet needs without mm-hmm. overdoing it. I think sometimes if you're, there's some of the programs where you're not really talking to your veterinarian, where you're just kind of stopping by and getting vaccines done or say buying them from the pet store or something like that, then there's a risk that they're getting potentially over vaccinated because that's more of a program where it's just we're making it one size fits all and not not tailoring it to that individual. So okay. I think if you have a good relationship with your veterinarian, the majority are not, I think, aggressively over pushing vaccines. Mm-hmm. They're just trying to keep them at what yeah. what we believe to be the best for your pet in that situation. Right. And what about your writing? You write every day? (laughs) I wish, I wish. Right now, it's not so often. Um, I'm a little bit tied up. I don't yet. My my big dream uh, in the future is to have a writing arena that's covered with lights so that I'm not stuck when the sun goes down, not being able to ride. And so, you know, now with the short days and working long days at work. I don't always get to ride, but I have ridden my pretty much my entire life and love to ride. So I try to ride as much as I can and really enjoy it and do a little bit of competition. Um, when I have a horse that I feel, you know, that we are suited to that, like we have a good connection and they're talented and, and we enjoy it. Um, otherwise, I mainly ride dressage, which is kind of the boring Olympic horse sport that you might watch where the most fun is when they do their musical freestyles, kind of like figure skating, where they got <laughs> they get to pick their own music and, and pick when they do their movements. But realistically, it's a very like, well, it fits my OCD kind of nicely. It's a very like <laughs> subtle. Very precise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not like all the big jumps where you're like, yeah, we could die. It's just kind of like, nope, we're, we're trying to be very pretty and very perfect, which is completely <laughs> unattainable as human beings with horses. But, you know, we always have this goal in mind. And it's about a connection to your horse, which that part is what I really love is that you know, it's the emphasis behind it is that I connect to the horse and that I make them or not make them, but we're able to communicate in a way that the movements and the actions that we do seem, you know, as close to effortless as possible. And that I'm each day with training them, trying to make them stronger, make them, you know, better than they were the day before, fitter, more balanced and things like that. So, that's, you know, what I love about it is it's a very, dressage can be a little bit more of a, a sport that you're in your head a lot, which is fun. Do you feel like the horses ever train you a little bit? Oh my goodness. You every think? time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you learn, like every horse you ride, like teaches you something too, like just in how to ask or not ask or you know, just everything. Oh yeah. I've learned, like I have right now, my old man is about 34 somewhere in there and he has taught me so much 
he's taught many, many writers, like generations of writers since we've had him over the last 20 years or so, so much about how to ride and, and how, just how to be with horses. And so, yeah, wow. we, we owe him so much. That's beautiful. So can you tell us a little bit more about the companions you share your life with? Yeah. So right now I would say my main man is Percy. who's a little, he's just like a little mutt. I don't know how to describe him. I sometimes say he looks like a cross between a frilled lizard and a rat, Um, (laughs) but he, he gets to come with me to work. He's got a little bed right next to my off and my desk. And so he patrols for crumbs and gets belly rubs to make everybody happy. And he also loves to patrol the ranch. We have a big, Anatolian shepherd named Angus and they're the big white dogs that help protect Mm -hmm. livestock and so Angus loves to just stay on the ranch but Percy will come home and they'll go on a big patrol so it's really adorable because Angus is like 115 pounds and you know like three feet at his shoulder practically is a huge dog and then there's this little tiny nine pound dog next to him and so they run all around and my mom has her little miniature collie essentially a shetland sheepdog named ash and he's her companion everywhere and you know we typically have cats both in the house and in the barn and that's at this point kind of my my little companion animals besides the horses that's so amazing sounds like they're having a great life i I just can picture it i want to live that life if i come back (laughs) next time as a dog (laughs) right they do they get to do quite a bit. I think Percy really enjoys his balance between napping on, you know, beds anywhere in the house, wherever he wants all the time. Plus, you know, the outdoor life. He, yes. He's really enjoying it. Yeah, that sounds really nice. special. So what do you do besides um, work that makes your life so beautiful, Kirsten? I think, you know, I, I enjoy my time on the ranch, the riding, yeah. even just sometimes the mundane stuff like fixing fences or cleaning stalls or whatever. That's building a shed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be prettier on the other end of it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be great. I know. All these things. It's been this last year, you know, I'd mentioned we had been burned over in the Kincaid fire. And so this last year has been quite an adventure in terms of like kind of rebuilding and what you have. And, you know, I'm extremely thankful we were all off the property when the fire came, you know, all the critters and people. And so we were all safe and they, the firefighters are amazing. They, they kept our house intact, you know, and worked really hard up here. So that has been, it's been more work because we did lose our barn. And so we, you know, trying to readjust from that has been, been a lot, but still, you know, people are like, Oh, aren't you going to move out after that? And I'm like, Nope, I know we could burn again. We're going to be smarter. And I still love it so much here. And this is, you know, where my roots are that I don't want to leave. So Mm -hmm. even just, just a joy to see the sunsets. Yeah. I can hear your your voice, very positive outlook on everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right, Cruz. Well, it was great having you on today. Thank you so much. We loved it. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. I'm glad to help out. I love your mom, David. So (laughs) (laughs) there you go. We all love David's mom. Yes. Anyway, go ahead, David. Give a shout out to uh, your practice or how people can. Yeah. Yeah. So I currently work at Memorial Beach Veterinary Hospital, which I believe our website is memorialbeachvethospital.com. And we're here in Healdsburg, right by the bridge, uh, hence the Memorial Beach part of that, you know, and we're open Monday through Saturday, you know, always trying to help out. I tend to specialize or see mainly dogs and cats. We've even got a vet. Some of the other vets will see things like chickens or birds or reptiles that sort of thing. And so, you know, kind of as we discussed, there's a bunch of us there trying to help your pets live as long and healthy, healthy and happy lives as possible. That's amazing. a very special practice. Thank you so much, Mm -hmm. Kristen. It was just a pleasure to talk to you today. You're welcome. Thank you. And we're looking ahead to next week and give it a go then. Yes, we'll give it a go next week. Thank you so much, David. It's been fun. All right, Patty. Great having you. Bye. Bye.